Howdy folks, Jabariki here. Disney is a company that's best known for being super protective of their wholesome brand. But it's not that the studio has only ever made squeaky clean kids media. Heck, a lot of Disney movies have ended up becoming traumatic childhood memories for many people. In this video, I'm going to be counting down my picks for the top 5 darkest Disney animated films. Keep in mind, I'll only be counting movies from Disney's main animation studio. Fantasia. This was Walt Disney's experimental project that combined classical music with animated interpretations. It was Walt's most ambitious and mature film that he ever produced. Due to a variety of segments, you never know what kind of animated short will come up next. Sure, some of these cartoons lean towards Disney's usual brand of cute and whimsical, but there are also plenty of darker shorts too. One moment we're watching Pegasi flying peacefully, or ostriches performing goofy ballet. But then we get something like The Sorcerer's Apprentice, in which Mickey Mouse magically turns broomsticks to life, only to violently murder them when things get out of control. Then, each of them are suddenly resurrected, and Mickey almost drowns from their shenanigans. We also deep dive into the existential dread of the beginning of time, watch a crazed Zeus throwing thunder at a drunk Dionysus, see dinosaurs brutally killing each other, and then each facing their own gruesome deaths. All of this nightmare fuel builds up to the final crescendo of Night on Bald Mountain, in which ethereal demonic spirits flock to the giant devil Chernobog, who torments his minions under the moonlit sky, while grinning sadistically. Even the the orchestra scenes come off as kind of ominous and eerie. Because the musicians are hidden in the shadows, the lighting looks like it belongs in Dario Gento's Suspiria, and conductor Leopold Stokowski towers on his podium with his back to the audience. Which comes off as unintentionally intimidating. This film has scarred many kids, and I can see why. Kids are basically playing roulette, never knowing if the next cartoon will be friendly or scary. Oliver and Company. Oliver is an orphan kitty who ends up befriending the ragtag gang of Dodger and friends, who are owned by the poverty-stricken Fagin. Unfortunately, Fagin must owe a certain amount of cash to the loan shark Sykes before a deadline. Oliver helps Fagin's dogs heist a lavish family car, but Oliver gets tangled in some wires, and is saved by the family's daughter, Jenny. Dodger and the gang sneak into Jenny's home, collect a sleeping Oliver, and take him back to their home. However, Oliver admits that he loves living with Jenny. When Fagin learns that Oliver now has a rich, wealthy owner, he sends a ransom to Jenny's mansion, in hopes that the hostage money will help him pay back Sykes. Then, Fagin realises that Oliver's owner is actually a sweet little girl, so he reluctantly backs out of the scheme, and returns Oliver to Jenny. This enrages Sykes, who decides to kidnap Jenny for the ransom instead. It's up to Oliver, Fagin and the dogs to rescue poor Jenny. Now, Oliver and Company is best known as a talking dog comedy full of show-stopping tunes, but we have to remember that it's still an adaptation of a dark Charles Dickens book the set in 80s downtown New York City. Behind the Broadway songs, Goofy shenanigans and cute bonding is a sinister crime story that's surprisingly seedy for a Disney animated film. It's wild to imagine that the brand protective House of Mouse actually greenlit it for kids back in the day. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! No, no, no! Stop! Please, thanks! Please! Sex, I'm getting you money tonight! It's coming tonight! Please, it's from a rich cat! No, I mean a cat from a rich family! Please don't! They're coming tonight with the money I owe you! It's a pretty unflinching movie right from the start. The film opens up with a kitten being abandoned in the rain, and then chased by ferocious dogs over a wire fence. There's a rough realism to the film's urban setting too. It's not just a spooky forest and a fairy tale. It's a shady part of an American city, where real-world threats lurk around every corner. I mean, I consider Sykes to be the studio's darkest villain to date, because he doesn't harbour any of the traits or tropes you'd expect from a Disney baddie. He has no musical numbers, he doesn't have an exaggerated campy personality, no supernatural powers, and his design isn't colourful or quirky. He's a very real lone shark that's been animated and voiced like a cold gangster from a Scorsese movie. It's almost like he doesn't belong in a Disney film. Do you know what happens when I don't see my money, Fagin? People get hurt. People like you get hurt. The movie doesn't sugarcoat the tragedy of poverty either. While Fagin and his dogs are a loving family, they clearly struggle to get by and live in terrible conditions. What's sadder is that once the film ends, Fagin and the dogs are still poor and life will continue to be difficult for them. Disney released quite a few dark movies during the 80s, a decade when they were trying to find an identity without Walt. But I personally think that Oliver and Company was the most daring of them all. 
the rescuers. Poor little orphan girl Penny has been kidnapped by the evil Medusa and her sidekick Snoop so that they can force her to climb into a tiny cave and find them the legendary Devil's Eye Diamond. So two mice called Bernard and Bianca, who work for the Rescue Aid Society, agree to go save Penny all on their own. There's this sense of melancholy throughout this whole movie, from the murky and desaturated backgrounds to the haunting songs of Shelby Flint. Hey, the film is mainly set at night in a decrepit boathouse guarded by gators, which resides in a gloomy swamp. The somber tone is made even sadder by Penny's feeling of hopelessness, as she struggles to believe that she'll ever escape these abusive adults. Don't worry, Daddy. We'll... we'll be... alright. We also can't help but fear fearful for Bernard and Bianca, who are woefully disadvantaged against the threats on the boathouse. Their every waking moment is fraught with danger. While our villains are made up of a campy diva and a nerdy bumbling minion, the two of them are disturbingly cruel to Penny. Not only does Medusa use narcissistic tricks to guilt Penny, but I've tried hard as I could. Honest. Of course, we have, but we must try harder, mustn't we? <laughs> then please, will you take me back to the orphanage, like you promised? Penny, don't you like it here? A big, beautiful boat all to yourself. But the two of them are also willing to risk this innocent child's life for a diamond. The water's coming in! Please pull me up! Not until you get the diamond! Once Penny is no longer useful to Medusa, she drops her auntie act, then gleefully aims an actual gun at the poor girl, and even intentionally fires it at Penny at one point. I honestly don't think that Disney would go that far today. Sure, our heroes do eventually defeat Medusa and successfully rescue Penny by the end, but just imagine the trauma that's been scarred into this kid's memories. She was kidnapped, tortured, and bullied by criminals, all while trapped in a rickety, moldy boathouse. Now, sure, this film's sequel, The Rescuers Down Under, shares a very similar premise, but it has warmer colours and a bigger emphasis on spectacle. I wouldn't say that it gets truly dark until its finale. That's not a knock at The Rescuers Down Under. I just wanted to explain why the sequel isn't on this list. Pinocchio Geppetto is a kindly puppet maker who builds himself a little wooden boy called Pinocchio. That very night, he makes a wish upon a star. Then, a blue fairy brings Pinocchio to life and assigns a bug called Jiminy Cricket to be the boy's conscience. Jiminy has his work cut out for him though, because Pinocchio is constantly duped and conned into doing the wrong thing. I'll be totally frank, I think that Pinocchio is maybe Disney's most pessimistic film to date. Sure, Geppetto is a sweet old man who shows that good exists, but it's kind of overwhelming how malicious the big wide world is outside Geppetto's home. Pretty much nearly every scene in this movie is about little Pinny being exploited by villainous crooks, each one seeing the boy as a gimmick to sell. There's a painful frustration to seeing Jiminy doing his darnest to guide Pinocchio, while the naive boy falls for every single trap. Woohoo! Oh, little boy! Ah, oh, there you are! Oh, where were we? Ah, yes. On to the theatre. Bye, Jiminy. Bye. Goodbye. Did, did, did. Huh? Meanwhile, Geppetto, who journeyed off to find his son, has ended up stuck inside the giant whale Monstro, where he struggles to survive, with every fishing attempt being a bust. So even when we're not watching Pinny being exploited, we're witnessing an old man suffering and starving. However, the most traumatising aspect of the film is Pleasure Island, a theme park that lets little boys do whatever they want, only for each one to be transformed into a donkey and forced to work for an evil coachman. It's been 83 years since this movie came out, and to this day, it's still extremely horrifying to watch Lampwick transforming into a donkey while screaming for his mother. Please, you gotta help me. Oh, be a pal. Call that beetle. Call anybody. or little boys carrying in fear over becoming slaves. And what might your name be? Alexander. Hmm, so you can talk. Y yes sir. I want to go home to my mama. Take him back. He can still talk. What's worse is that none of these kids are saved or rescued by the end. They're left to live the rest of their lives as donkey servants to these child catchers never given a chance to redeem themselves after falling for Pleasure Island's temptations. Pinocchio sticks out from the House of Mouse catalogue because it's the closest we've ever been given to an animated Disney horror film. It's unforgiving, relentless, and stomach-churning. Not even a happy ending for Geppetto and Pinny can make us forget what we just sat through. The Hunchback of Notre Dame One night in Paris, 
the evil bigoted Judge Frollo chased after a Romani woman, until Frollo tried to snatch a baby, which caused her to fatally lose her balance. Frollo then discovered that her baby was deformed, and tried to drown it in a well, but the Archdeacon stopped him by reminding him that God's eyes are watching. Frollo agrees to raise the child as Quasimodo in the Bell Tower of Notre Dame. However, Frollo has been teaching Quasimodo to hate himself, fear the outside world, and resent the Romani people. All that changes though when Quasi meets Romani dancer Esmeralda, who teaches Quasimodo to love himself and not believe Frollo about her people. Unfortunately, Frollo becomes obsessed with capturing Esmeralda and is prepared to burn down Paris to find her. Quasi must partner up with former guard Phoebus to protect Esmeralda and save her people from Frollo. When I did my top 5 darkest Disney scene stream on Twitch, none of my entries included moments from Hunchback. Why? Well, because I couldn't pick a specific scene in this movie that's especially dark. The whole movie is dark! Because it's rooted more in gothic melodrama than Disney traditionalism, the film tries to have comic relief characters in the form of free-talking gargoyles, but there's only so much they can relieve. Oh, it doesn't look good. It's hopeless. Absolutely hopeless. You're telling me! I'm losing to a bird! This is a film about a disabled man who has been forced to live alone in a tower, with his only contact to the outside world being his abusive and racist adopted father, who isn't caring for him out of love, but religious obligation. Quasimodo, can't you understand? When your heartless mother abandoned you as a child, anyone else would have drowned you. And this is my thanks for taking you in and raising you as my son. Speaking of, it's actually quite shocking that the film dives into Frollo's repressed lust, all through a hellish musical number in which he tosses and turns over his first for a Romani woman. I see her, the sun caught in her raven hair, is blazing in me out of all control. While the film does have its moments of dry humour and prattful slapstick, these things don't really distract us from the fact that this movie is mainly about a genocidal tyrant who wants to wipe out an entire race, all while he traumatises an orphan who has never felt real love. The Hunchback of Notre Dame is so outside Disney's comfort zone that you could argue that it's more suitable for adults than kids, hence why it's my number one pick. So those are my choices. Which would you say is the darkest Disney animated film ever made? Let everyone know in the comments section below, and don't forget to click that like button. I've been Jambariki, feel free to subscribe, cheerio folks.